Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to ask you a question to begin with. How many of you guys have been into a coffee shop in the last week? Could you put up, you don't have to stand up, but you can put up your hand. So that's uh, an awful lot. And uh, I want to ask you another question. Um, can you just summon up a mental picture of that coffee shop and uh, answer me this? Could you imagine walking in, sitting down next to a stranger, and asking for the latest news, then debating it for hours on end? No, that's a no? OK, another question. Um, could you imagine marching in, whipping out a book of poetry, slamming it down next to someone's vanilla ice latte, demanding to know their opinion before delivering your own précis of the book in a big, booming voice to the whole shop? That's a no. OK. Um, what I want to reveal to you tonight, or this afternoon even, is that 300 years ago, the streets of London were lined with a very different breed of coffee house, where such behavior was actively encouraged. Um, they wouldn't think you were a menace or a nuisance or a freak if you just went up to a stranger and started talking. This used to happen day in, day out in coffee houses all over the city. And one individual in particular, uh, his name was Dudley Ryder. This guy behind me, he was a coffee junkie. And he was local as well. Uh, he lived in uh, Hackney, in Bohemia Place. And uh, back then, Hackney was a very different place to what it is now, as you might imagine. It was a bucolic paradise. It was like an Arcadia beyond Moorfields. It was surrounded by all these meadows and fields and market gardens. And this is the junction that he used to use to get into London. This is the junction of Cambridge Heath Road and Mare Street. Um, a, a bit different, isn't it? And you can just about make out the Dome of St. Paul's in the background. And um, he dropped in to the Hackney Coffee House. This was about 301 years ago. And he recorded in his secret diary, he saw a room full of people. He didn't know any of them, but he sat down, asked them what the latest news was, and he heard alarming reports that the Jacobite rebellion that was swirling in Scotland was moving ever closer to England, and it was going to come down and take over London. And he debated it for hours on end, and then he left feeling edified and refreshed. And for Dudley Ryder, that's what his uh, family home has become, by the way, a bus depot. Um, for Dudley Ryder, like for so many people, coffee houses were emancipatory spaces. They freed people from the strictures and straitjackets of society. They allowed people to interact with who they wanted, how they wanted, where they wanted, and in a way that they wanted, without abiding by any kind of class concerns or um, any notions that certain subjects were taboo. And every time Dudley Ryder took a sip of coffee, uh, every time any of us take a sip of coffee, we're participating in a ritual that stretches back 361 years to this alleyway. Anyone know it? This is uh, right in the thick of the city of London. This is St. Michael's Alley in Cornhill. For it was here, in this churchyard, in the year 1652, that this man here, uh, who was an eccentric Greek entrepreneur called Pasqua Rosé, he opened London's first coffee shack. I say shack because it didn't have any of the things we associate with houses, like tables or chairs or a roof or anything like that. And uh, he opens it uh, against those black railings, which were then a stone wall to the churchyard garden. Now, I don't know if you guys are coffee connoisseurs. I mean, from the amount of people that put their hands up, I'm guessing quite a lot of you are. But if you're into your silky smooth flat whites brewed to mathematical precision in one of the, the finest third wave coffee houses in Hackney, the taste of the 17th century stuff would have you headed for the nearest toilet bowl. Um, this was routinely described, even back then, so it's not just a case that our taste buds have become more refined. People at the time thought it was disgusting as well. It was routinely compared to oil, ink, soot, mud, and most commonly just shit. Um, <laughs> Nonetheless, this bitter Mohammedan gruel, as it came to be known, it would transform the face of the city, bring people together, and inspire brilliant ideas. Pasqua claimed that it was a miracle cure for just about every single ailment he could think of, uh, and people loved the way that it stimulated the body and the mind and sparked conversations. But the main reason for its success, uh, and this might come as something of a surprise, but until the arrival of coffee, most people in the country were either slightly or very drunk all day long. Not because we were a nation of alcoholics, but because you couldn't drink the river water unless you had a death wish, because it was notoriously polluted. So the arrival of this 
Gruel would trigger a dawn of sobriety that would lay the foundations for spectacular cultural and economic and scientific growth in the decades that followed, purely because people were thinking clearly for the first time in their history. So this was the jet fuel, you might laugh, but it's true, this was the jet fuel of the Enlightenment, this, uh, this kind of uh, hellish concoction, as it was known. Um, and you can still find the plaque in the alleyway today. And uh, he triggered a coffee house boom. Um, by the turn of the 18th century, there were 3,000 coffee houses all over the city. And much unlike all those kind of blands, Cafe Nero's and Starbucks and those kind of depressing places that have invaded our high streets today, the great thing about the original coffee houses was that every single one was different. So I'm just going to take you on a whirlwind tour of some of the more outlandish establishments. If you went to Chelsea, you could go to Don Soltero's Coffee House, which was a museum of monsters. You had snakes and crocodiles nailed to the wall, and Isaac Newton would be sitting in the corner, sipping his coffee, musing over the monsters. If you went a bit further west, you could go to the Grecian Coffee House, which was a cauldron of scientific debate, so much so that a natural philosopher turned up one day with a dolphin draped over his back, and he proceeded to slam it down, whip out a knife, and dissect it to prove his theories on dolphin dissection. Um, so imagine trying that in a Cafe Nero today. Um, here's what it has become. Let's not forget the Latin coffee house. This was opened by Hogarth's father, not one of his better commercial propositions, because it had one rule, one rule only. You had to speak in Latin all day long, or you were thrown out. <laughs> that lasted about two weeks, and uh, it operated from this magnificent uh, priory that's still there in Clerkenwell today. Um, elsewhere, there was a floating coffee house, a glorified dance floor for rakes and dandies. And even when the, the ice froze, which it did, because they had a little ice age in the 17th, 18th century, they used to set up coffee houses on the ice, um, which you can see there. But what about round here? Because there were coffee houses in Hackney as well. The most famous was perhaps the Hoxton Square coffee house. And uh, Hackney then was renowned for its lunatic asylums. It was full of madhouses, public and private. So what better activity to do in the Hoxton Square Coffee House than what they called inquisitions of insanity, whereby it's very politically incorrect, but a suspected madman or woman would be tied up, thrown into the coffee house. Everyone got to go and sort of prod the alleged lunatic, and then they'd retire to the table, sink a shot of the disgusting coffee, and vote, are they actually mad or not? And if it was unanimously declared that you were mad, you were dragged away to a madhouse for the rest of your life. And uh, these events were highly popular. And of course, we still have a mildly pretentious sort of idiosyncratic uh, coffee houses today. This is, of course, the serial killer. Uh, I just put that in for a joke, really. Um, OK, so in spite of this diversity, um, th there was a kind of common thread. Um, it's easy to recreate what it was like to actually go inside any of these coffee houses. Um, so the first thing you'd notice would be that you'd be engulfed in a whirlwind of smoke and sweat and steam. And eventually, the haze would clear and you'd see a scene much like the one on the screen behind me. Long wooden tables, long wooden benches, smartly dressed men, and they would be drinking, thinking, writing, piping, debating, um, you know, like uh, persecuting the coffee house cat, etc. One thing you wouldn't see would be any women inside. Um, the only woman you can see in this picture, of course, is the woman in the bar. And unfortunately, coffee houses liked to portray themselves as sanctuaries of rational thought and uh, level-headed debate. And in the misogynist mindset of the day, women were simply incapable of that. So they weren't allowed in. If a woman was seen in a coffee house and she wasn't pouring out the gruel, it was automatically assumed that she was a prostitute. So these were male-only zones, and, and that was one of their shortcomings. So the haze is cleared. Everybody will put down their, their coffee, put down their newspaper, put down their pipe, and they would point at you, and they'd all scream out the following words. Your servant, sir, what news from Tripoli? Okay? Sometimes it was abbreviated simply to, what news have you? Right? And if you were in the Latin coffee house, it would have been quid novi. Now, although technically it cost one pence to get in, and you could stay there and drink and think and debate for as long as you like, the real currency was news and gossip. And you weren't allowed to sit down until you divulged a nugget of gossip. This might be something you'd read in a paper. It might be something that you'd made up. Um, and it normally actually was something that you'd made up, because these places were wellsprings of misinformation and lies, as much as they were credible sources of information, much like the internet today. Uh, you'd get to the front, you'd see a Cupid-like boy pouring the coffee from as high a height as he could. That was called pouring it a la mode. Uh, and um, you wouldn't so much start 
your own conversation, you'd melt into one that was already in full flow. That's why I began with that perhaps slightly facetious seeming question. That's what this gentleman in the black is doing on the right. He's melting into a conversation that is already um, in full flow. So why was it like that? Why is it so different to the experience of going into coffee houses today? There was a fortuitous collision of factors, the most important of which was a media boom at the start of the 18th century, and that was dovetailed with the growth of cities and the rise of the idea of politeness, which meant that people should try and interact with as many people as they could, so they would chisel away their rough, antisocial edges and become shiny, polished, and polite. And we're still living with the consequences of that today. Uh, Dudley Ryder, he was a man who was a uh, 23-year-old guy. He was gauche, he was awkward, he was ruthlessly ambitious, though. He was um, dissatisfied with his own personality. And in the spirit of the Enlightenment, he saw personality as something that could be molded and manipulated. And uh, he used to kind of adopt guises to present a favorable impression of himself in these public coffee houses that were so convivial. And uh, ultimately, he kind of succeeded in knitting together a super personality based of all the people he had observed in the coffee houses, which he foist on top of his own unsatisfactory personality, which he kept hidden in the diary. And he went on to become famous, and he actually rose up to become the Lord Chief Justice. One of his favorite coffee houses, and perhaps my favorite too, if I could go back in time, would have been Buttons in Covent Garden. Now, this was just a stone's throw from the piazza itself. It was opened by this man here, Joseph Addison, the great poet and playwright, mainly because he didn't like his wife that much, so he wanted a kind of retreat from a tempestuous marriage, but he being who he was, it soon evolved into an emporium of wit, and all the great writers of the age, Addison, Steele, Pope, Gay, Swift, etc., they all assembled there and cast their superb literary judgments upon the work of aspiring writers, making and breaking literary reputations in the process. So if you got a thumbs up from those guys, it was like getting a retweet from Stephen Fry on Twitter today. People would rush out and buy the book. And watching it all from a hook in the corner was this. It's a lion crossed with a wizard. I've never been able to see the wizard part myself, but it is. And the public were invited to feed it with letters and limericks and stories, the very best of which would be roared out in a special weekly edition of the original Guardian newspaper. So this really was uh, a medium for an interaction in society beyond borders. And um, there's actually still a coffee house that operates from the site of Buttons today. Um, so here we have the sort of literary convivial buttons. Do you want to see what it is today? Yes, you were whispering it. You, knew, you divined it. You knew. It's a Starbucks. There's, there's not even a blue plaque. Um, it's one of London's many lost coffee houses. And for me, this is a big, big shame because the kind of mode of interaction in a Starbucks is utterly different. In Starbucks, people sit sequestered from the world, immersed in their own thoughts, tapping out little babblings on Twitter or Facebook. Either that or they just stare out of the window miserably into the sort of drizzly street beyond. There's no fizz, there's no buzz, there's no conviviality. If you talk to a stranger, they think you're absolutely clinically insane. Um, and you're not going to be staring into the sparkling eyes of a customer inquiring after the latest news. Um, you're going to be staring into the dull electronic glare of a smartphone or a laptop. And uh, for me, the kind of interaction that you get in places like Starbucks is more reminiscent of what we see in something like this. This is Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. It's an image of urban ennui and anonymity that's uh, so affecting that it really sort of sears itself into your minds. And that, for me, is what Starbucks is like. And you can see here a, a typically miserable scene in a Starbucks. <laughs> uh, this is not... Uh, well, well, why does this matter? Um, I, I, I think, basically, as we slide into an increasingly virtual world, and you know, it's going to come a point where the barriers between the virtual world and the real world uh, are going to dissolve altogether um, in a very real way, not in a sort of futuristic, dystopian way. But, um, and I think, in light of these developments, uh, we can't remind ourselves enough the importance of face-to-face -face interaction in an increasingly virtual world. Think of trolling. You know, I'm sure you will read, I don't know, the comments at the bottom of the Guardian or the Independent or the whatever you read. Y you very rarely have a level-headed exchange of ideas. It's kind of vitriolic character assassination, one-upmanship. And um, if you're in a coffee house where you've actually got a real physical person in front of you, then you know, it's not going to break out into an argument. That was a spectacularly ill-timed slide because there's a picture here of a man throwing a cup of coffee in <laughs> someone else's face. Uh, just to show, I'm not fetishizing these coffee houses, um, but they remind us that we can lose touch with this face-to-face -face plane, which I think is very important. Finally, there are a few grounds for hope, well, quite a lot of grounds for hope. Um, over the last uh, eight, ten years, there's been a renaissance of small independent 
coffee shops all over London, a lot of them in Hackney. Here are some of my favorites. There's Towpath on de Beauvoir, a bit like the floating coffee house, that one, because you can sit on the floating seats. You've got the Hackney Pearl in Hackney Wick, uh, the Proud Archivist in Haggerston, uh, Violet Cakes, these are just my locals, really, Violet Cakes, <laughs> Wilton Way. And they have managed to elevate the art of making a cup of coffee into this kind of Epicurean art form. You know, these flat whites, they're to die for. We've come on a long way since the days when coffee tasted like shit. And uh, in all these places, if it's brewed even sort of slightly too hot or too cold, all these gadgets start beeping and it has to be remade. So that's good. But we still don't really have a space where you can go in, sit down, maybe at a themed table, philosophy table, politics table, conspiracy table, and just talk to strangers, a bit like what we're hopefully going to do today. So having just listened to all of that, with your help, I'd like us to make it a revolution in the true sense. That is a turn of the wheel back to the halcyon days of the 17th and 18th century coffee houses. So next time you go into a coffee house, I don't want you just to sit on your own and uh, check your email or read the news. I want you to scan the room for someone you've never seen before. It can be someone you like the look of. Okay. Then you walk over to their table, you sit down, you slide your chair ever so close, you <laughs> lean in, you put your hand on their shoulder, and then you scream those four immortal words, what news have you? And if enough of us do it, then we will spread the revolution. Thank you very much.